birds are just like a seed, but you're never quite a flower. You feel more just like a weed. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Galen Lee, and welcome to another edition of Sunday Sessions. And today, my guest is a friend who I met. Where's the first time I met you? Was it because of Ann Arbor? I think so. Okay, so Elizabeth McLean. Yeah, it was the first time. So Elizabeth McLean is a professor of musicology um, at, uh, well, now at Virginia Tech, but I met her when she was working um, at Ann Arbor, uh, the University of Michigan, and we had, like, I did a bunch of gigs there. She introduced me to a lot of her disability rights, uh, like, music kind of combo groups and we just really got along and so I thought she would be a good guest for this show so Elizabeth why don't you kind of introduce like the meat of your work and then we can do the presentation she's going to kind of do a college lecture vibe uh except for in three parts so we can talk in between so um yeah why don't you kind of let me know what you want people to know about you thanks yeah um like Galen said, my name is Elizabeth McLean. I should let you know that my cat Misha has decided to join us. <laughs> um, he's a gray and kind of brindle colored tabby. Um, Misha is an emotional support animal and he also does medical alerts. So what he heard was my heart rate a little elevated because I was oh. excited to do this. <laughs> so he's coming to calm me down. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, uh, for those of you who would benefit from it, um, I'm a white woman with long blonde hair and glasses. I'm wearing a green shirt and a blue sweater and I've got my orange crutches in the background. I think also the poster, um, Galen, from when we met hanging on my wall. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, it's, it's a little interesting because um, as a musicologist, I was working in music and spirituality in the 20th century and like art music, you know, symphonies, organ pieces, that sort of thing. But as a disabled person, I got very much involved in disability activism. And I used to try to keep those parts of my life separate. And actually bringing you, Galen, to Michigan and seeing the impact of your work was a big motivator to dive in headfirst and actually start merging these two worlds, right? Finding ways to do disability activism within scholarship ways that scholarship can support the people who are out there doing the work. So I teach everything from music history and music theory to some disability studies now. Um, I have a class that's called Disability Culture in the Arts that's new at Virginia Tech. So we get to talk about music and poetry and- I just wanna take that class. Well, I, wait until the second or third time and it'll be nice and smooth. <laughs> no, but, um, so not yet. Well, the, the first time I taught it was online and um, having all these conversations in an online environment can be tricky, but it was wonderful. And really getting at the heart of what disability community and culture looks like, our shared values and, and that sort of thing. So that's where my work's going. My big project besides my more traditional musicology type work, um, my other big project is working on what I call a crip ethnography of disabled performing artists. So that's where you go in, you get to know the people um, that you're, you're studying their music, but how they function, for me, I'm interested in kind of two big questions, right? How they access a music industry that was not built for them, and then also how they kind of live out their values and culture and activism in their work. But so cool. yeah, the, the twist here is that since I'm disabled, I feel like it's a little bit easier to get that not just access intimacy and like interviews and cons like I, I know a little bit more about what you need or it's quicker for me to catch up. Um, but also my personal experiences then inform the work and hopefully helps me build trust. So it's not like, you know, I'm taking somebody's work and using it for my benefit or to build up my resume or something like that, but we're, we're partners in it. Yeah, no, it's cool. I, uh, I really have a lot of respect for, the work that you do and then especially I think the idea of compiling and kind of getting people like the people you're going to introduce today besides me I mean I'm in there too but there's other people um who deserve to be taught in like music history and they just haven't ever been and so I think 
Um, so I, I mentioned last week I'm working on starting up. I haven't mentioned this to you yet, but you'll be, don't worry, you'll find out about it. But um, I'm working on starting up kind of like a, I don't know if it'll be a nonprofit or organization that's going to be kind of a resource for um, disabled music professionals and artists. Um, and music professionals can be pretty broad because a disabled booking agent's going to book people a lot differently than a non-disabled one. And so um, kind of starting this resource uh, part of it is because people say, well, I don't know of any, you know, I want to be inclusive, but I don't know who's out there. And so you need those, like, not just lists, but you need those, like, here's how you get a hold of them. Here's what they've done in the past. And like, here's what they're about. And I think it's really cool that you're doing a similar thing in the scholarship side, because I'm not really in like, academic scholarship. Um, not obviously, but you guys do not want me to write. And I had so many incompletes my senior year. I was like, I finished, I got done, I think I wrote 20 papers in my last month or something ridiculous because I was so behind, and I was like, well, never going back to college unless, nope, pretty much just never going back to college. So, <laughs> this yes. Is, this is something you would probably appreciate. This is a book I'm holding up um, by J. Timothy Dolmage called Academic Ableism, and college wasn't built for us. Mm -mm. Most of us don't graduate, even if we're smart and hardworking and you know, doing everything we can just because the system wasn't built to hold us. And those of us who do graduate often take longer or it's kind of a non-traditional path, um, which is part of the reason, you know, there, there's always that little bit of me that's like teaching music history is not that important when I could like, I don't know, go to law school or be on the front lines or go with ADAPT somewhere and get arrested um, and try to draw attention to really important causes. But on the other hand, I feel like when you can infiltrate, then it's about figuring out how to use your privilege to like, I, I cannot remember who told me this, which is horrible, but um, a much, much wiser person once told me that if you can get yourself through the door, you then have to actually like wedge the door open, sometimes with your body to let more people in. And then when there's enough of you, you can rip down the door entirely. Yep. Um, so That's I do I think about that, like sometimes it hurts being wedged in the door. Um, I mean, I guess it helps to have crutches and wheelchairs on <laughs> We have <Yep>. advantage. <laughs> to like <laughs> shield your bones from it. Yep. yep. Exactly. Can I share um, my first slide? Because that yeah. like will let me help. Get, let me get it pulled up. Okay. So yes, feel free to screen share whenever you're ready. Awesome. So um, what I kind of want to do is I want to break this down and I don't want it to be too college -y, hopefully, but I want to talk first about this movement, right? Like what is disability justice? Um, the second part um, will go into a little bit more on three different artists. Really, it, sh it should say more than three. So we're going to look at Leroy Moore and Crip Hop Nation, which is a whole network of artists that he's, he's assembled and some of the work that's come out of that group. Um, then Kaylin Heffernan with Wheelchair Sports Camp. And then we'll talk about Galen because that's, oh, my favorite. Um, then in part three, we'll talk a little bit more about this piece, right? Like why it matters and how this information can change everything from like music education for kindergartners. Like what music are we being exposed to? What do we learn about making music in elementary school? All the way up to how we train our professional musicians and how scholars like me decide, you know, this is good music, this is bad music, how we hire musicians to come to our schools, that sort of thing. Cool. So kind of overview, hopefully. But yeah, this first piece, this is going to be maybe the most like new words I'm going to introduce the whole time. Um, disability justice is not the same thing as disability rights. Sometimes you'll find an organization that is using the phrase disability justice, and it's like they did one of those search and replaces on Microsoft, the word. Um, they just like swapped the words out, but they actually do mean two different things. Uh, and it's, um, it's important to try to be precise about it where we can. So the disability rights movement, this is a lot of info. I'm not quizzing you, I promise. Uh, I just wanted to put a lot of different names here because something might resonate with you, right? Um, the disability rights movement uses the slogan, nothing about us without us. And this is something that we're going to see maybe even more true of disability justice. But the idea is that in the um, latter half of the 20th century, for those of us in the United States, we had a series of related movements that brought more civil rights for disabled people from the independent living movement, uh, which 
you know, we see in our current centers for independent living to like deaf president now, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, um, but when Gallaudet University, the first like big, well-established kind of high reputation liberal arts school specifically for the deaf and hard of hearing, when their students finally demanded that the president, the person running the university should be one of them, um, there is gonna be a new, I don't understand if it's a documentary like movie or series from Netflix soon about Deaf President Now, so keep an eye out for that. Um, the 504 sit-ins and the ADA with Judy Human, which you can see in Crip Camp. Uh, even orgs like ADAPT. Usually if you see disabled folks being like people in wheelchairs being arrested in the halls of Congress, it's often <laughs> ADAPT. Yep. Um, and and this is, these are fantastic organizations and people that we owe a lot to. But as we kind of move into the 21st century, we realize that the leadership of the disability rights movement was very white. Some of them were very focused on disability as a single issue and certain disabilities kind of rose to the top, right? Um, we saw a lot of steps forward for wheelchair users and deaf folks, but not as many for those with things like intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I, I didn't even say this, but I obviously use crutches. Um, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and some other chronic health conditions, but I'm also autistic. Autism is a developmental disability. My whole like series of development, the way my brain developed, all of this is very different than kind of the norm, if we can call it that. Um, when we talk about intellectual disability, some autistics are intellectually disabled and some aren't. Um, a good comparison might be like Down syndrome typically has both intellectual and developmental disability, where with autism, the rate of intellectual disability is about the same as the general population. But folks who are kind of seen as different because of how their brains function, they were not always included in these movements. So disability justice comes along and says, okay, how do we actually include everyone? Um, disability justice teaches us, and I should say on this slide, there's an image of the cover of the disability justice primer, which shows octopus tentacles and teeth and a, like looks like a very curvy spine, like the vertebra and a flower and a leaf because it's called skin, tooth and bone. The basis of movement is our people. But within disability justice, it says all of our bodies are not just unique, but also essential. Like we all contribute, we all have something to offer. And that means that all of us, whether we're labeled as disabled or not, we all have strengths and needs that need to be met. And we're all powerful, not despite all of the complexities of our bodies or all the differences between our bodies and minds, but because of these differences, like these differences are where our power comes from. Um, this last one's really important. It's this idea that all bodies are confined by ability, race, gender, sexuality, class, nation state, religion, and more, and we cannot separate them. As a white woman, I experience ableism differently than a black man might, just, might experience ableism. And it's important that in our movements, people can bring their whole selves. Because you really can't leave your race at the door when you show up for disability work or you know, leave your wheelchair at the door if you show up for racial justice work. We have to find a way to let everybody be whole. I've been talking a long time, Galen, sorry. <laughs> this was the last thing I was gonna do before you know, turning it over to you. <laughs> but the, um, the basic principles of disability justice are this idea of you know, intersectionality. That just means we all have a lot of identities and we all kind of exist at the intersection of a lot of these identities and we can't separate them, right? Wholeness means we should be able to show up as everything about who we are. You don't stop being your religion when you enter a room, it's always a part of you. Um, same thing with your disability and your gender and all of that. We try to organize across movements, but also across disabilities. The trickiest one on here is the anti-capitalism one. That's the one that often like scares people a little bit, um, which is understandable. <laughs> But what this means, the, the way I try to explain it is that if you're in a purely capitalist system, a person's worth is determined by how much they can work. Like it's by their labor. What do they create? How do they make money for that system? And what we're saying here is that your worth is not actually tied to how much you can produce or what kind of job you can do or how you contribute to an economy. Like, 
we have worth because we're human beings and we have worth for who we are, like full stop, right? Um, the other, the second column here, sustainability, just meaning we have to build movements where we don't burn out. I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> I'm not going to put words in your mouth, Galen. But... Well, but you yes. wouldn't be wrong. It's an it's intense tough. world. I mean, it's especially during this pandemic, like a lot of us ramped up our activities. It was weird seeing a lot of like able-bodied folks talking about having free time and finding new hobbies because a lot of disabled folks were like, hey, please don't kill us. Please wear your mask. Like, please don't cough on me. I, I, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, I like did a whole campaign in my hometown about getting a mask ordinance, like, which is good. I mean, I'm glad, but it was definitely not like sitting around doing nothing times. I should also note that the technology we're using today, video conferencing, talking about working from home, these are all things that disabled people help develop and, some, and they fought for. And these are accommodations that we needed before the pandemic. And it was a really weird feeling to go from people saying, no, you can't work from home to like, nope, everybody can work from home today. So please, wherever you are, try to keep ways to work and learn if you're a student, socialize all of this from home because you'll include more disabled people, honestly. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, that's a big reason I have kept these shows going and I have plans. If I can swing it financially, I want to keep them going even into 2022 just because, yeah, I think people can come who might not be able to come and they can tune in later and it's the more access, the better. Um, just finding ways to make all art kind of more accessible in general, which I think is important. So, yeah. yeah. And I've been using this as a model for some other artists who've said like, how do I make my shows accessible? I'm like, hey, let me send you a YouTube link. Um, <laughs> just having a lot of different modes of access and especially now with the podcast too, that's yet another one. Um, this interdependence word is really big and it's actually a kind of simple concept. Uh, we grow up thinking that when we're adults, we're gonna be independent. And independence is kind of a myth. If you think about it, no one of us actually lives in isolation. I don't know if you've seen Parks and Rec, but like maybe Ron Swanson is slightly independent. Like even he needs other people sometimes. He likes people. Like maybe um, growing, like maybe you grew up with someone, like your dad worked 40 hours a week and your mom stayed home and cooked and cleaned and helped with the kids and like both incredibly huge full-time jobs. That means both of them were interdependent, right? Like, no one of. Uh, I think um, I don't want to. I don't want to make fun of my father, but we used to joke when we were kids that we would just have like chili and tuna casserole over and over again if my mom was gone, because those were like the two meals. He, and he's like, I can cook these well. They were good. I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not bashing the chili or the tuna casserole. Um, but there's all thing. All of us have things we can't do. And even if we think we're independent, we didn't pour the cement on the roads that we're going to drive on. You know, we didn't build the cars ourselves or however you want to think of it. So this just means that all of us have things that we contribute and we have things that we need help with. And the issue with disability, the ableism here, is that some things are socially acceptable to get help with and some aren't. And that's just kind of nonsense. This is where my autistic brain, I think, helps me. Like, you know, is there really a difference between not being able to cook and feed yourself healthy meals every day and needing assistance showering? Like there really isn't like morally and ethically, but like, there. so this principle of interdependence is kind of embracing that. And this is where it's a little different, right? The independent living movement does talk about independence a lot. We want to find disabled people you know, an apartment where they can live independently. We want them to have jobs. And yes, they have care support and all of that, but we have this goal of independence, which is why it wasn't accessible because some of us are never going to hold down a 40 hour a week job. We never are gonna live alone or don't wanna live alone. So there's space here, but then yeah, the, the collective access will lead to collective liberation. You know, none of us are free until all of us are free and we can't all be free if we don't all have access to the movement itself, to work, to school, to joy, uh, to marriage. Yeah, yeah, that's still a thing. Um, although there is a bill now that you can call your representatives and ask them to support that would nationwide get rid of the marriage penalty. Oh my gosh, really? Okay, yeah, you're I gonna have to give me that, that link. 
and I'll there's a really good spot. There were like 45,000 signatures last night. I'll send that to you. Um, and this last point is really important. Leadership of the most impacted. People who are most harmed by ableism or racism or sexism are the ones that understand it the best. So we need to let them lead when it comes to finding solutions. And this is where we'll talk, I'll, I'll let, let you take over for a bit, Galen, but this is where um, like when we come back, we'll talk about like, what does that mean then for the white woman to be telling you about a movement that comes from people of color? So cool. <laughs> Well, that is awesome. I'm, well, we, we don't have to talk for too long. I just think it's really awesome to, um, are you going to keep sharing your screen? Oh, yeah, or not? I Sorry, I wasn't <laughs> sure. There we go. Um, no, I just think it's awesome to hear these definitions broken down. Because I mean, um, I guess what I didn't realize till talking to you is that my interest in music is disability justice. I've been saying the word disability rights, but I actually don't mean that because in the group that we're starting, I wrote a definition of disability. I mean, not that I am a genius and I know, but I've been like, the word impairment really bothers me and limits really bothers me. So I redrafted a definition of disability that doesn't use those words and is more like typical and diverging from uh, just because I really think, yeah, disability justice is kind of seeing the whole picture zooming out and being like, um, why are we labeling certain positive, negative? Like, I mean, neurodivergent already did that for the community of folks that, that live with those uh, issues, but I feel like disability as a whole could be a lot more zoomed out in the way that we talk about our uh, s unique circumstances, I guess. Does that make sense? And it's not about being PC, it's yeah. like, Literally, how much more positive does it feel to talk about like, oh, this affects my height rather than this limits my height? I think the words that we choose are so subtly powerful. And then, I mean, you're, there's so much more to unpack with like race. I'm glad you're including uh, Leroy in this discussion because um, I think, yeah, uh, disabled artists with mobility issues like me are definitely limited. But if you throw... Uh, race on top of the issue or like include it, it like is part of what he's dealing with in our society it's we definitely don't have the same exact experiences we maybe have some overlap in different areas but you can't um, I think you're right to just try to feature as many diverse voices in your work you know I think about that when I make this show I'm like well I am a white lady making this show Okay, so I'm trying, uh, especially as I'm booking farther out, to just be mindful of like the more diverse voices, just the better off we are in this whole discussion. Yeah, like there's, there's nothing wrong with being white. I think that's a common exactly. thing right now that when you start talking about race and diversity that you're like supposed to feel guilty for your race. There's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being white, but the thing is I can go into like a diversity committee meeting and suck up all the air in the room and leave no space for these other people who are dealing with, you know, maybe not just the sexism I deal with, but then also other things. And when we talk about like the concept of intersectionality comes from a black, I'm pretty sure from a black woman now, now I should have written more notes. Um, but he was looking at laws and how sometimes even our definition of sexism, for example, or, or discrimination based on gender would be built around a white woman. But black women have a whole other set of ways that they might be discriminated against. So it's not even just like racism plus sexism, but it's also that intersection looks different. And we have to make sure like our laws and our policies work for everyone. Yeah, right? like our, like, our universal, right? Yes. Like I think universal should be the goal. Like that's why I love the idea of universal design. And rather than just talking about like, this is the ADA requirements. It's like, why aren't all the buildings just built universally at this point as much? And, and of course there's so much nuance in the world that you're never gonna hit every single person exactly the same way. That's not what I'm trying to say, but we can think about these issues as kind of like, okay, who are we leaving out if we do it this way? And like, okay, let's try not to do that. And to the most of our ability, be backing up far enough where you can actually allow everyone to enjoy whatever it is that we're talking about. In our case, for this discussion, it's performing arts, right? So. Um, just, yeah, are you, ba are you backing up far enough where you're actually including all the kinds of artists that there are that, that you know, that you could be? You know, that's what we 
need to be aiming at. So I'll let you continue your thing because I, I don't want to make the captioner stay too long and I do want to get through your oh, whole talk. Okay. No, I mean, she, she's very cool. She probably, if you see the captions cut out midstream, that's because Erica got really tired of us. I'm just kidding. I don't think that will happen. Um, so I'm going to get back to get sharing. Back. Here you go. So yeah, um, this is Leroy Moore we were just talking about. What's really cool about him is that he was part of the group that initially came up with kind of codifying what disability justice was. It was sort of in the air in discussions. And he was one of the founders of the group Sins Invalid, which is a performing arts collective in the Bay Area. Um, they're the ones that wrote that primer and kind of articulated this. They continue to do work. But he also has an organization called Crip Hop Nation that he co-founded with Keith Jones and Rob Denoy's Temple. Um, Rob has unfortunately passed, but Leroy and Keith are keeping the legacy alive. Um, this particular, I wanted to show you the image of Leroy here. He's sitting on a scooter. He's got a camo jacket. He's a black man who has his um, hair closely shaved and he's holding up a fist in the air. Um, one thing that he's doing, and we're not going to listen to this piece, we'll listen to a different one, but I want to show you the lyrics. This is from the untold story, Disabled Black Boys. And we can see that a lot of what Leroy is talking about, things like um, protests being inaccessible, thinking about how as a grown man, what is it that he needed when he was a younger boy with a disability? He has uh, cerebral palsy, CP. Um, and how then does he do better for the next generation, right? How strange it feels when you have organizations like ADAPT very focused on curb cuts, while as a black disabled man, he's very worried about police violence. Um, and how I, I've talked to some other, it's not just Leroy, right? Like I've talked to a lot of black scholars who are out there doing, or scholars and activists and musicians who are out there doing great work and feel like, you know, they can't talk about access when they're talking about um, things like, you know, police brutality, but they also then like can't talk about police brutality when they're talking about access and people don't see that that overlap. The piece that he asked me to share with you today is um, called Dear Hip Hop Audio Letter. And I'm just going to play a little bit for you. Um, and they're playing on the idea of like Tales from the Crypt. So it has some cool horror movie music. I've got the text on this slide just so you can get kind of a sense. And then the middle part is actually um, Leroy reading this letter to kind of the hip hop industry, hip hop culture, all of that. So let me. the link to you in one form or another so you can hear the whole it's 14 minutes long <laughs> so you can hear the whole thing and the soundcloud link also has the whole text from the letter that's written in the middle but i'll just summarize it for you a bit um so one of the things that is critiqued right away is the charity model which is something we haven't talked about but the idea that sometimes disability is approached from the lens of charity. This comes from the idea that, that you know, there's something broken about disabled people and non-disabled people should help fix it. That sounds really nice, but the problem is they don't know what we need, <laughs> right? Um, so sometimes they can inadvertently make things worse, uh, like very well-meaning people can make things worse or they speak over us. And it can also put us in a position of both learned helplessness, we're never allowed to develop the skills we need to advocate for ourselves or do things for ourselves, 
um, but also we're kept in poverty and in a state of infantilization. That's why you can't save more than $2,000 in a lot of, or you can never have more than $2,000 in your bank account in a lot of states. If Don't you're- get me started on that. I mean, that's why it's so hard in most states to get married because they never imagined disabled folks should get married. And if they got married, then their spouse is their caretaker. I mean, there, there's a lot of really strange things that come from it. So Leroy and the other kind of on behalf of the other members of Crip Hop Nation, which is international. I mean, they have folks in Germany. They have folks in Africa. I'm pretty sure there's a chapter on every continent but Antarctica now. Uh, and it includes musicians, visual artists, dancers, activists. It's, it's not just music. Um, but they call out not just the charity model, but then hip hop in a or ableism in hip hop in general. So um, really cool that Leroy messaged me and said, I'm allowed to share this with y'all. He's hinted at it, I think on his social media a bit. But um, so Leroy Moore has been accepted to the PhD program at UCLA in anthropology. Yay! So, so he can start doing this work and not depending on scholars like me, but like actually doing it for himself. Damn. On top of this, Keith Jones, who was one of the co-founders, is moving to LA. So they'll both be there together. They've been on opposite coasts for a while. They are um, making a lot of headway with the Crip Hop Institute, which he wants to have an archive of all this work that people have done that has been ignored or folks haven't known about. He's collaborating with the Hip Hop Museum. They've signed with a management team. And like, there's real big actual seeming like lasting institutional, we can leave this kind of change happening, which is really, really cool. Yes, that is amazing. That is really yeah, cool news. Books, by the way, which I promised. One that I have my students read is on um, Black Disabled Ancestors, which has like five stories that are interactions between various historical or you know historical Black disabled figures. Fantastic, but here's more. And I think we're gonna drop links for this on yeah Galen's all over that but you know I have the sites here where you can kind of look for them but there's the real cool thing about Leroy's work is that it's not about him at all it's always about everyone else to the point where every time I ask him for a recommendation he's like oh here's like 16 people who should do it and I'm like do you want to do it do you want to get paid because all of this work he's done has been on like you know social security money. Like he has had to navigate the rules of that system and still build things, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Rising Phoenix, this is a big success. So Rising Phoenix is a documentary about the Paralympics that's on Netflix. It won two sports Emmy awards, one for a long sports documentary and the other one for outstanding music direction. And what's cool is Daniel Pemberton who was in charge of the music for this decided towards the end after watching the footage and seeing how important it is that disabled people are the ones kind of in the driver's seat, he goes, oh wait, we don't have any disabled musicians. So he contacts Leroy, not knowing by the way that Leroy was a Paralympian, which I think is really funny. Like Leroy thought, oh, this is why they, no. I mean, they found him <laughs> through the website and stuff, but um, it was even funnier that like he could have been in this documentary and that's how, that's how our stories aren't told enough, but um, he recommended a number of crip hop artists and Tony Hickman, George Tragic and Keith Jones all actually appear. Um, they have kind of the title track, right? The It's called Rising Phoenix 2. I'm gonna play a little bit for you. Yeah. But the whole thing is a beautiful video. The captions are like built into the art of the video. Um, on YouTube, and we'll have a link for that later. In the yes, five and eight arrived here from the right before the eyes and it to the sky. They had you for a while, but then they tried. Leave me an example and do everything in life I see. A simple thing like riding a bike, we are alike. How is that enlightening? There's so much fighting. Cause my superpower, it makes me different, it's lightning. Wait, how many obstacles I gotta break? How many fights I gotta face? to make you feel my fate I shake then I break down yeah but I take all the way down I'm a rising feet I rise above you 
And this is extra cool because one of the first really big Paralympics, like broadcast and people were really learning to appreciate the sport was in London. They had huge opening ceremonies, um, but they didn't hire any disabled musicians. So like the idea, like disabled musicians were somehow behind adaptive athletes in terms of like public consciousness. Wow, that's intense. That was awesome, by the way. I got to go listen to everything in that film. I, I feel like there's no way to have an appropriate picture of Kaylin. Just She doesn't love- make any appropriate. She like intentionally will not make an appropriate photo. So <laughs> even more fun, because one of the cool things I want to talk about with Kaylin is that she um, so Kaylin Heffernan is the MC for Wheelchair Sports Camp, and she is really a fixture of the DIY art scene in Denver. Um, but she's got a bigger reach than that. Like, it's not like only people in Denver know about the work. Um, she's pictured on the slide. She's a, a short white woman with longer blonde hair and a, a backwards baseball cap sitting in a wheelchair and flipping the bird at the White House, as she might do. And she is an activist musician who really pushes for access, health care, and human rights. And um, one cool thing about Kaylin is that she campaigned for mayor of Denver in 2019. She didn't take any corporate money and christened herself the tiny happy mayor. Um, And when (laughs) there's a cool interview she did, I think with Leroy, because it just says Crip Hop Nation, but I think it was with Leroy, um, where she says that they did everything to make it inclusive and accessible to people most commonly left out of our political system. These are her words. We brought hella people together and made things happen in real time, like building ramps, repurposing signs, predatory cash for houses, or we buy ugly houses, into Kaylin for mayor signs, feeding hundreds of folks, throwing events, paying artists, et cetera. We spent zero dollars doing traditional campaigning. And this was a, a really classic example of how it's not about winning all the time, it forced a lot of the mayoral candidates who were kind of more mainstream political parties to talk about issues that they previously felt like they could ignore. Now, (laughs) there are so many great wheelchair sports camp songs, but the one I wanted to share with you is called Hard Out Here for a Gimp, which is a play on Hard Out Here for a Pimp. And um, this one line that there's a stairway to heaven So tell me how the hell are we going to get in? And on the music video, there's actually like a chair. This is a still from the video of a wheelchair, like falling downstairs in a purple tint. Um, I think it speaks to kind of the level of the work here. It's she's very clever, very witty. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening in the music, like having that kind of limping kind of beat, which imitates the like pimp walk that actually comes from disabled folks, you know, this kind of line. Um, so I'll just play a little bit of this one for you and then we'll hop over to Galen. <laughs> the inspirational porn star. Oh, my cute wheelchair costs as much as a sports car. Look, we got enough problems, so need for you to call a cop who can't solve one. Tis the season, get a job. Taking pics with Santa in the middle of the mall. Unless you're good at bagging groceries or pushing carts through the snow freeze. Good thing for goodwill. Oh, please. Every time I go to a show, I can't see shit, but I park front row. But I don't ask for no pity. So why you rapping so shitty? Oh, shit. Okay. So tell me how the hell we gonna get in. Well, I don't know. Lord knows where I'm at in the heart out here for a gift. The way she makes kind of that, um, you know, no pity, the slogan of the disability rights movement into them, like, a line for people making fun of her for not being a good rapper like cracks me up. There's also one earlier where in this piece where she says, um, shut up, Kaylin, you talk too much. Or no, wait, no, Kaylin, you talk too much. And then she says, shut up, you walk too much. (laughs) I have wanted to use that in faculty meetings. I've not, close, (laughs) muttered under my breath. (laughs) No, she's so, I love Kaylin. She's gonna be, she was a guest in on my last uh, July twenty sixth show last year for, but there were a bunch of people. But she's gonna be a guest, like full time guest in October sometime. So I do really, yeah. Kaylin's pretty rad. I 
I want to get like everyone in one space at one time because you, you I think you told me a story once about a music festival that had two stages so they made you perform at the same time it's so like yeah. everyone had to listen to one of you is that right I'm yep. butchering it no you're right uh, I did a festival in Iowa called Day Trotter Downs and it was two stages there were two venues and they had music going all night and you could kind of bounce between the venues but they put a uh, wheelchair sports camp on at the same time as me so we were bummed that we didn't get to see each other but then we were secretly pumped because it's like oh no matter where you go at this festival you're gonna see a disabled performer that's pretty cool and I think they must have done that on purpose they never mentioned it but like I think it's cool I mean I would I would have advocated for that had they asked anyways so that was pretty awesome but that's an example how some of us who are like behind the scenes and not performing we have a heck of a lot of power right like who knows what person made that scheduling decision and was like look what I can do Mm -hmm. um but there, these little things do add up because it might have meant that was the first time somebody had attended a live show. You know, I mean, yeah, this work matters. And it, it's funny that you said you're, you know, recently thinking about yourself in the context of disability justice. When I've been presenting at conferences being like, Galen's working in disability justice. Um, but that, that is an example of how sometimes scholars will see something or audiences will see something that might not be what's intended. And you have that kind of that interesting space, right? Like you're putting things out in the world and that's also how it's received. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why art is such a huge part of this kind of work because it catches people at a place that's not entirely intellectual and just kind of just gets right to the heart of it. Um, And then artists have permission to talk about stuff that a lot of other people don't really. Um, So I think it's yeah, I think that that's one reason I'm such a big proponent of just getting more disabled people in front of whatever the mainstream is, whatever you want to call that. It's just because you automatically will walk away thinking about it, even if they never actually talked about it. It just is part of it. It, it ends up in your art, even if it's very subtle. It ends up in the way you talk about things. I mean, it's just it's just a part of who you are. So it's impossible to walk away without having at least experienced a little bit of what it could look like to have a more inclusive culture, if that's what you're going for, which is what I'm going for anyways. So. Well, and that's interesting. Like everyone behind us, the, like the founding of disability justice, it's always been tied to the arts. So it's almost, um, it should be more of a flex for people to divorce it from the arts than it is to like see how it operates in these spaces. Yep. I feel really weird talking about your music to you I was gonna mention do like, to, do you want me to turn off my camera? <laughs> well, I was gonna mention like, do you want to tell the story of where the song comes from? I wait. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so so I, I wrote I wrote this song um, in response to um, the healthcare debates that we were having, the infamous ones where, you know, John McCain finally put his thumb down and it saved Medicaid or whatever, and um, that was a really frustrating time. Um, and it hasn't, not a lot has changed since then, unfortunately, but like, um, you know, in the, all the articles about what would happen if we get these programs, um, so often disability was totally not even mentioned, even though it's, you know, Medicaid and Medicare are programs that keep people out of nursing homes. They keep people like me, like, so when Paul wasn't my PCA, because we're together 24-7 now, but back when I used to work and he worked, I had PCAs come help me and like, just, I mean, and anything. I mean, there's so many reasons that healthcare is important, right? But part of it that people don't affiliate it with is that is what pays for a lot of people's supports to be independent. It's not just about, oh, of course, you'll be able to still go to the doctor or get a wheelchair. It's a lot more than that. Healthcare covers a lot. Um, so I was very frustrated that I wasn't seeing more disabled people being interviewed about it. Um, it was like not even an issue until finally a bunch of people started getting arrested because of the DAPT. Uh, they would go in to the senator's offices and they weren't getting meetings, so they would get pulled out um, and arrested. And then it finally started getting attention. Um, and obviously, I just think we can't be left out of the discussions anymore. It's happening. One of the reasons I'm working on this music group now, the disabled music group with Lachi, is because, and others, there's many of us actually involved in this. It's not just the two of us. But one of the reasons we're doing that is because they just came out with a huge study on inclu- <laughs> inclusion in the arts. And guess what they didn't ask any questions about? 
at all. Disability. There were zero questions. It was a humongous five-year study of, like, all the different areas of marginalization, which, I mean, is important knowledge, but why the heck didn't anyone think to include disability? And that's where we're at right now. So this is what that song is about. But you can't... Again, I'm not going to stop performing because of this. I'm not going to alienate every single person I know because of this. So that's kind of where the conflict comes in is you can be mad, but you still have to live here. Well, you don't have to. I choose to stay around and live here, right? So, like, how do you balance the frustration with being left out and making enough noise where people finally start paying attention? So that's what this song is about. That was a very long intro. You probably could have no, done it a I lot love faster. It. I, I'm happy that I was like reading over um, this, the script that I read at a different conference and luckily I didn't get the details wrong yet. Um, but <laughs> I, I love this passage because the whole idea of like being angry and breathing fire and being able to burn anything down, like I live in that space. Um, rage is the negative emotion I can most easily access. Ask my colleagues. No, but um, this idea that you can't incinerate your home, like that's what makes it so tough. It would be easy to just like, you know, confront medical ableism with your doctor or whatever and just like unload on them. Like we have the knowledge, we have the life experience, we know the way things should be, we know the law, but you can't burn the place down if you still need healthcare, right? Like you can't burn all of your bridges at a job that's inaccessible. Um, the musicology side of me loves that um, in this piece, the one I'm gonna play isn't the live version, but um, your notes are like they're very clipped and you have that steady pulse and you just feel time ticking away and restraint like you have those moments where you open up but that like feeling of having to restrain yourself is so relatable mm -hmm. i guess i should play I should the audio so folks can hear what we're talking about did you know that when i get angry My cat decided to join for that. I think he likes your singing. <laughs> Cute. Um, so I feel like we've talked about this the whole way through, so I don't really need to say a lot. Um, but the idea here is pretty simple, right? Like if we're talking about disability in music, it needs to be led by disabled people themselves. Like if we want to know how to make a venue accessible, Galen knows how to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or if you're inviting an artist, believe them when they say these are my access needs and pay for it, right? Like if you're going to hire them, you know, you need to include any access things, um, any privilege you have. You might not feel like you're powerful, but we all have power somewhere. And it's really about how, how you use it. Um, whether you're a K-12 educator, whether you just have kids, whether, I mean, whatever your role, if you can teach disabled musicians like as disabled, so they're fully present, that's gonna make a huge difference. I use the example of Beethoven, which I won't get into a lot of detail about other than plugging a book by Robin Wallace called Hearing Beethoven that gets into what Beethoven's deafness actually was like and meant. So much different than the myth. But if you work with, again, work with these folks, you find the community, you ask what they need and you do what you can. And you do have to listen and follow their lead, whether you're, you know, especially if you're non-disabled, but even in the community. I have no idea what it's like to have a why, right? Like I have to listen to you when you say you need something. I have no idea what it would be like to be an Asian American disabled person right now with that particular set of, of things. Um, so yeah, should I jump and do my shock or stop the shock plug real quick and sure. then, sorry. I um, one time in my whole life didn't have enough material for my students. So now I have way too much material. <laughs> Um, one big thing you can do if this is kind of lit a fire under you and you want to do something. Well, we'll send around afterwards the um, the link to support that legislation we mentioned. But the Stop the Shock campaign, which I have on this slide, is a hashtag Stop the Shock. So you can follow the conversation on social media. There's a place called the Judge Rottenberg Center. It's an institution in Massachusetts. 
and it primarily houses folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are perceived to have behaviors that are too difficult. Um, they use this device called a graduated electronic decelerator or a GED to administer electric shocks directly to the skin of disabled people. So they have to carry a backpack that has a battery in it all the time and they have the electrodes stuck directly to their skin and the teacher or any authority figure, whoever's working for the JRC in that particular situation can hit a button and administer an electric shock. People have died from this. Um, you can be shocked for anything from like, you know, giving your teacher a hug to yelling after you've been shocked to being scared and hiding under your desk. I mean, the reasons why you're shocked are numerous. The United Nations recognized this as torture years ago. Like this is an official document. And I think it was even under the Obama administration that that declaration happened. So disabled folks have been fighting for years to have this torture stop. Um, I, I messed up on the slide, but the FDA banned its use last year, finally said, nope, you can no longer use this. But the pandemic happened and the ban was put on hold saying, you know, the JRC said, we can't administer new therapies, we can't try new things because we have to stay locked down. Um, then last week, the DC Circuit Court struck down the FDA's ban on a technicality. They said the FDA regulates devices and medicine or medications, but it doesn't control the use of medicine. So they couldn't ban the use of the device. So people are still being shocked primarily people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and especially those of them who are Black, Indigenous, or otherwise people of color. So please follow this campaign because we need to push back. We need the FDA to ban the device entirely. Tweet about it, call your representatives, and demand that it ends. You can follow the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network or the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network for the latest updates on kind of the activism side. So. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for doing that. Yeah, so for those of you who were watching last week with Raul, um, you know how he was talking about when he infiltrated a, a nursing home, basically, um, in order to prove that it wasn't the same as living in your own house, because that was the argument for cutting funding. Um, and he said, the thing is, is that you end up, there's a certain degree of learned helplessness that you, you get because everything that's, above the absolute bare minimum for work is considered troublesome. And it's sort of along those men like same, you can draw a mental line to why shocks are used. It's like, oh, it would be easier to do this than to like actually figure out what's going on in the person's mind and like help them calm down in a better way or, or whatever the rules that you impose generally are <laughs> oppressive anyway so there's so many reasons why this is bad and so I'm glad that you're bringing that up I'm sad to hear that um the ban has been struck down temporarily and I'm hoping that we can yeah um, yeah the hearing the hearings for the first ban um included hours of specialists coming in and arguing that people with autism and similar disabilities don't feel pain what? like are you joking me I'm not kidding you. Um, oh so gosh. there's a lot of very like eugenics and dehumanizing stuff here. Yeah. Um, and this is again, for a long time, this was kind of an issue that was siloed within a certain community and with disability justice, like I'm calling for everybody, right? Like all of us, whether you're an ally, if you have a different disability, like we need that solidarity. We need to show up for each other here. Yeah. Wait, so can I ask, is JRC the only place that uses it? Yep. They have a patent on it. Um, oh. If you trade JRC back. Um, so Lydia XZ Brown, they're um, a lawyer, an autistic lawyer activist. Um, you can go to their website, Autistic Hoya, H-O-Y-A, and see the entire archive for all of this. I mean, this is decades of, you know, documenting people dying, people who have um, quit their job there, been fired, then like coming out about the practices. Um, they, long time ago, the people behind this had a clinic in California and basically too many, too many children died. So they oh had my to be gosh, like that's ridiculous. Yeah, so call, 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 tweet, 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 but honestly call because what I've heard is that that is actually like a very, very effective way to get your message across. Not that social media isn't useful, but calling, no. taking that 10 minutes to actually make a phone call has more impact because it's tracked in a way that social media is not tracked. So um, spread the word, but also call. So thank you. Is there anything else on your slides that you wanted to share? I'm not I mean, sure where we're at. I, not very pretty slides. I mean, here, like, this is weird. Recommendations for other artists, oh, maybe? Yeah. 
yeah. all listen to this. This was literally me just cornering Leroy and Galen, like on one conversation and then taking it as gospel and putting it on a slide. <laughs> um, and it's funny because wheelchair sports camp shows up on one side and Kaylin shows up on the other. Um, there are so many great musicians you can follow. Uh, Leroy mentions some folks like Blind Willie Johnson, Curtis Mayfield. Um, Tony Hickman was one of the people we listened to today with Keith Jones. Um, another one he's introduced me to, or introduced me to is Kingfish. I didn't realize Kingfish was autistic, blues guitarist. He was on, I'm pretty sure he was on Luke Cage. Oh, wow. um, but anyway, yeah. And then Lachi, who you're collaborating with, Velvet Crayon, Vic Chestnut. I mean, anyone else you'd recommend? I love being like, here, listen to music. Yeah, I'm trying to think uh, off the top of my mind. Um, Amy Abst is from Minnesota. She's got... Um disability chronic illness i guess i could say um trying to think who oh, else? Well, if, you you getting, if you want to if you want to start getting into deaf music sean forbes well oh, yeah. West, um Man mandy harvey right is she deaf i think if i recall off the top of my head okay <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are there and that's the whole point of like what you're compiling and what we're trying to do at ramps is just get that information out there and then help people find each other because a lot of people we didn't really get into this and I probably should play a song or something before we end but um, but I mean there are a lot of the a lot of the reason disability culture hasn't made it farther in the mainstream is because a lot of people with disabilities don't want to identify if they don't absolutely have to so I can't not identify if you could see me you would know that I have a disability I'm in an electric wheelchair it's just there's no way I can hide it but there are a lot of disabilities where people try to downplay it or not even come out at all because it does um because the way our society is set up there's a fear that they won't be seen as like a desirable act to book or they'll be too difficult or whatever there was a study done in England where I think it's something like 70 percent don't quote me on the exact number but lots of disabled artists um jeopardize their health and wellness to play shows I mean I have before I'm getting less and less willing to do that but like um Just, doing things yeah, that like, aren't that safe other artists like I I have I have heard so, so when I talk, I have some artists that I talk to who are not openly disabled that I can't talk about right now, but they have actually cited what you said about like not performing in an inaccessible venue, even if you can. Yeah. Like they're listening to you and following your lead. Well, I it's hope awesome. that's, I mean, yeah. So accessible venue. I mean, that's, that's why we got to get into the mainstream is the thing that people don't realize, and then we'll have to wrap this up. But the thing that people don't realize is that disability is not a niche issue. Like 26% of people have some kind of disability in America, right? And not only that, if there was a study in New York, 70% or something of New Yorkers said that they were closely linked to a disabled person. So married to friends with uh, son has, uh, you know, like so many different reasons why disability affects us. And so when we get over that myth that disability is somehow a rarity and that that it's a mind. I mean, it's barely a minority issue at this point. I would say just because of how much it affects so many people in our lives that it touches us. You know, my parents have a ramp on their house, obviously, because otherwise I couldn't get in. And so they are affected by accessibility, even though I don't live with them anymore. Right. And so if we stop thinking about it, is this like uh, because the reason I think is so problematic for professionals like I we've talked before about how. I often get paid less than other similar professionals when we do gigs. Um, and I'm working on that. Like, I'm trying to just be like, no, this is what I charge. And that is it. Because it's seen as like, a, oh, this is a niche. Like, especially at colleges. I would say colleges where I experience it the most. Not so much private venues. But at colleges. Oh, we can maybe take you off screen share, actually. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, at colleges in particular, they see my performance as like, a social justice talk rather than an artist. And so the pay scale is different. And so that's an issue. But what I'm trying to say is the reason that it matters that we have disability represented is because it's also not a niche like genre issue. Like I think properly promoted uh, a disabled rapper like Wheelchair Sports Camp or Leroy could be just as popular as any other hip hop artist because people do relate to the issues. It's not a niche thing. They do see themselves in these songs or they see someone they love in these songs. And so it's not like a, 
oh, but nobody will relate, so we're going to stick with what we know, and we're only going to promote, like, pop, 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 like, mainstream. And where, where I think we could take ourselves out of this delusion that we are only going to relate, like, only someone in a wheelchair is going to like my music is just not true. Like, that's just not how music works. And so I think art is a good place to kind of deconstruct that myth that disability is a small issue that doesn't affect other people because it does and it could affect you at any time and I don't think that should be a good reason to finally care but if that does help you eventually you might need these things too right or someone you love so like let's all get on board rant 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 it's a a universal human experience it might be one of the only truly universal human experiences and that's why we're scared I think we know it could happen like deep down and it's still a scary thing but if we get people out there like living their best lives Disability is not sad. Like I love my disabled life. I feel like I'm a much better human being now than when I either, you know, wasn't disabled or was hiding the fact I was disabled. Like things are better. Yep. I know I don't hear that a lot, but like things are better. <laughs> yeah, I want the words like if you say, Oh, what do you think about when you think of disability? I would like there to be positive words in that group. I understand that there are negative aspects of any person's life experience and you can't deny those or belittle them, but there should be positive words like we wrote also for this ramp a definition of disability culture and it's like um innovative adaptable uh creative like just words that are real in disability but also positive because i just don't think we hear enough of that oh i, I could probably talk to you for like three more hours but i probably you know and i forgot, to, I forgot to about the spotify story oh yeah we can oh. always well really That's- quick i'll just say I got asked, so Spotify, very large company, I think we all are aware of that. Um, I got asked to lead a uh, panel on accessibility for Spotify employees. And I said, okay, well, this is my rate. And if I fly down, my husband needs to get a ticket too because I can't travel independently. And they said, well, we actually only budgeted $500 and we can only pay for your ticket. And I was like, Okay, well, if you put me on an official playlist, like a big playlist, I'll still do it. And they're like, well, we can't do that. (laughs) So I was like, well, then you can't have me come talk to you about accessibility because this is not really an equal playing field. Like, that's just a gross, gross playing field, basically. Is that summarizing it? I don't know what you took away from it. No, yeah, I mean, it was just a good example of, like, performative inclusion versus actual inclusion. And it's also what happens... It's the charity model. Like they thought somehow this was charity. Yeah. But they were trying to steal your labor. And I think it's another type of access we don't talk about. Like, you know, when I organize events trying to bring you places and the assumption is like services for students with disabilities or the ADA office will pay for it. I'm like, what do you think those, what? No. You know, this is a musical event. Yeah. So we're going to end on this one question that came up earlier on the chat. Um, Like, where is the fine line between I want to be independent, I want to have my own voice, but I also need help? And I think for me, the fine line comes is like, who is like in the in the effort to help, who is leading the initiative? Like to me, I think um, it, you know, like if a carpenter comes to build my house, I'm not going to tell him or her what nails to use because they're the carpenter right and I think um I could even offer to chip in and like I I pay them for their labor or I even like assist but they're in the lead of like how this house is built right because that's their that's their expertise and I think we need to start seeing disabled people as the people who understand how they need help and you know not everyone can communicate verbally so maybe it means looking around and getting input from other disabled people and not that one person but I think having choice and leading the charge is how we support other people and so it's the same way that we help someone in the kitchen if they're a chef we don't take over the whole dang thing I mean maybe I try to because I'm kind of bossy in the kitchen but like in reality um think of it as supporting role so you're a supporting role you don't have to be the person making all their decisions that's how I see it and I think disabled people often don't have the same level of choice. Now, we don't all get to choose, like, to live in a mansion. So I'm not saying that every disabled person has to be able to choose every single aspect of their life because none of us get to do that. But is it a comparable level of choice? Because I would say at this point in our society, disabled people still 
largely have a lot less choice in the way their life uh, goes down because of barriers that were erected in society or because of our attitudes. So it's like, let's level the playing field of choice and let's let disabled people kind of actually be the ones saying, this is what I would like and this is what I need in order to make that happen. And then you can feel good about helping because we do need help. Like if I didn't have help, there's no way I could tour, like not at all. So it's not that help is the problem. It's the direction that that help comes in, you know, is that, is that, do you agree with that? Yeah. So the first thing I thought of was free Britney. So, <laughs> so if you've been following the Britney Spears thing and the fact that she's under guardianship and ha ha apparently has no choice over her life, um, in the United States, like if you have an intellectual or developmental disability or otherwise might really struggle to kind of make all of the decisions and you need help, it often goes into guardianship. Like someone else makes your decisions for you, but there's a better model called supported decision-making where what you do is you get to build a team of people you trust and maybe you can't handle your own finances, but you get to pick who helps you with that decision. And ultimately you have the choice. Um, they'll kind of maybe step in to protect you if you know you're really going to get hurt or your life's in danger but ultimately you're kind of driving the bus and some of this i think of like i i have a friend who um has personal care assistance and it's really about whether or not you can fire them like can you fire someone who is abusing you or pulling your hair too hard when they're brushing your hair or whatever like do you have the right to fire them and that <laughs> like that's i think that's where it's huge it's about who is kind of driving the bus yeah, driving the bus. That's a really good analogy. So this was an awesome, I mean, I knew it would be a fun conversation. I'm so glad to have you on uh, the show. And it'll be a podcast in the next few days. I'm going to edit it down a little bit and we'll put it up as a podcast. So if you um, want to share it with people, you can either share this video or share the podcast uh, in a couple of days. That link is uh, galenlee.buzzsprout.com. But I will make sure that's in the video link too. So Elizabeth, thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, I guess I hope I get to see you in person sometime soon. We're well, going to be virtually at Virginia Tech in November. I will be. So at least we'll get to hang out one more time online before before the real world touring opens up again. So awesome. cool. Well, take care of yourself and thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Sweet. Cool. Oh, yeah, and then when you log out, I'll play a tune before they leave. So here we go. Sweet. If anyone's still here, it's been a long chat, but I'm glad we did that. So it's all good. Sweet. Here we are. I'm going to play you one tune before we head out for today. Um, I just think there's so much to talk about with Elizabeth. I'm glad we didn't get too rushed, but I'll do a song. I think I'm going to do Someday We'll Linger in the Sun. So, um, I'm going to do a tune for you. Thank you for hanging out. And uh, I really had fun talking with her. And I just think that Elizabeth, uh, her insight is important because she's going to help shape what people learn about in the future in school, which is huge. So, thanks for watching today. Um, this show is made possible in part by my Patreon team. Um, if you didn't know, Patreon is really basically how I'm keeping these shows going, uh, the podcast too. So if you haven't considered joining, that would be really appreciated on my end. I'm also writing a memoir, and so that's kind of giving me resources to work on my book instead of touring right now. Um, and then Sweetwater Music is also sponsoring the captions on this show, um, or some of them anyways. And then so is the Minnesota State's Arts Board. And then one of my patrons, Sean Anderson, is uh, donating at the, pay, uh, the sponsorship level, the Shooting Star sponsorship level. So she is um, 
a supporter of a place called Ariel Theatrical, and she wants you to check that out. If you live in the Southern California area especially, um, it's an organization she cares a lot about. So here we go. This is Someday We'll Linger in the Sun. Oh, yeah, and any tips you donate today are going to be split with Elizabeth. Um, so if you enjoyed the show, please tip generously, and it will go to help her in her, her life. So here we go. Thank you. 
thank you so much for listening. That was Someday Will Linger in the Sun. Um, and I hope to see you next week. I have a uh, Americana artist next week called Angela Sophie. Um, and she is from the Yakima, Washington area. So we're going to chat. She's a really cool lady. Um, met her this year virtually through the pandemic and on a podcast that she produces. I was a guest on her show and asked her to do my show. So we will be back here same time next week. Um, thank you for hanging out with me and take care of yourself. And thank you so much to Elizabeth for all your insights and knowledge and just fun conversation. So 